First, let's take a look at your screen. You have the presentation screen where you will see the slides I have to share with you. Then, to the right of your screen, just outside the presentation, you have the panels. The buttons at the top help you decide which panel you see in that area. On the participants panel, you have access to feedback buttons. Use these to answer simple questions as directed. In a moment, we will also discuss how you may use this panel in order to participate via voice over IP. You can also, also use the chat panel to communicate with us. Using chat, you can direct questions to us, simply use it to send comments, or even to a specific attendee, such as the host, using your drop-down menu to select the intended audience. It is possible that the chat panel disappears. If this is the case, simply click on the chat button at the top to bring it up. It is possible that the presentation is not showing well on your screen. If this is the case, use the click the zoom button and select fit to viewer for best results. If at any point throughout the presentation you wish to participate via voice over IP, simply click on ask for the mic. It is located on the right of your screen under the participants panel. Once I have passed you the mic, the bottom of your screen will say speak now. Once you have used the Ask for Mic function, you will no longer have to click that button in order to participate via voice over IP. However, your microphone will be muted when you have finished your comment and or question. If you wish to have the mic again at any point, simply raise your hand and the moderator will pass it to you again at the next available moment. Now, let's begin with the webinar. As I was saying, we have quite a few people participating today. We under, now that we understand a little better how we will interact together, I will mute everyone's mic. Although voice over IP and chat are available to all participants, we would appreciate if you can wait until the question and answer period as we may answer some of your questions throughout the presentation. Welcome to our webinar, everyone. Um, this is Jennifer Campbell, and I'm the manager, sorry, I'm the senior advisor in knowledge translation at CIHR. The, um, this webinar focus up, focuses on CIHR's healthcare renewal policy analysis funding opportunity. And it is intended for policymaker and researcher applicants who wish to learn more about the funding opportunity and ask questions about the preparation and submission of their application to CIHR. On today's webinar, we will provide highlights of the healthcare renewal policy analysis funding opportunity and the types of projects that this funding opportunity aims to support. We will also describe how the applications will be evaluated and CIHR's merit review process. There will be plenty of time at the end of this presentation for questions and answers. And in addition, following the webinar, we will make available on our website a more detailed version of the um, presentation for your reference. So before we begin, we'd like to get a sense of who has joined the webinar. And uh, so we ask that you take a moment to answer two questions. One, in the context of the health research community, how would you classify yourself? And there's some choices there. And shortly on your screen, um, you'll see a survey poll appear. And the second question is uh, your geographical location. Okay, so if you can just take a moment to answer that and then we'll continue. Okay, so the healthcare renewal policy analysis funding opportunity is one of eight funding opportunities launched through CIHR's evidence-informed healthcare renewal, which we also refer to as EIHR roadmap signature initiative. It is led by CIHR's knowledge translation branch in, in um, partnership with the Institute of Health Services and Policy Research. The EIHR Signature Initiative was designed to fund policy-relevant research that will help governments to make evidence-informed decisions about healthcare renewal in Canada and aims to do this in a timely way that meets the needs of policy and decision makers. The defined priority areas are healthcare financing and funding models, 
health system sustainability, and governance and accountability. For more information about the EIHR initiative, you can visit our website and Tiffany will post a link for that for you now. The EIHR initiative provides an opportunity for engagement across different disciplines, for example, health services research, economics, sociology, political science, population and public health, and law, and different sectors as well, such as health finance, education, and social services. We encourage cross-discipline and cross-sector collaborations that will generate novel solutions and contribute to the evidence-informed policy making. This specific funding opportunity aims to support robust health policy analyses that identify evidence-informed policy options for healthcare renewal in Canada that are rep responsive to the evidence needs of health system policymakers. So what is health policy analysis? Health policy analysis is an approach to public policy that examines new and existing research evidence to analyze policy options. The goal is to provide advice to policy, policymakers about optimal strategies as they work to resolve policy challenges in the health and healthcare sector. Health policy analysis is useful both retrospectively and prospectively to understand past policy successes and failures, to plan for future policy options and implementation, and policy analysis can also be done from a comparative perspective. Health policy analysis is an important tool for policymakers. It can help to understand which health policies have been successfully or not so successfully implemented and why. It can explore why policies are successful in one jurisdiction but not another, and help to understand what conditions are required for successful implementation. Intended and unintended consequences of policy decisions and obstacles and facilitators that influence outcomes can also be explored and identified. A key component of this particular funding opportunity is that applications must have an integrated knowledge translation approach. That means that the application submitted to CIHR must be the result of a collaboration between researchers and knowledge users, in this case policymakers, and must focus on policy question that is identified by the policymaker and is, is highly relevant and is a priority. In fact, it is required that there are two policy or principal applicants on the application, both a researcher and a principal knowledge user, who for this funding opportunity must be a policymaker based in Canada. Together, the policymaker and the researcher shape the policy analysis question, decide on the methodology, and work together to create, to interpret findings and move the research results into action. And here you see how we've defined knowledge user um, um, for CIHR. For the purposes of this funding opportunity, policymaker has been defined as a senior knowledge user who is directly involved in the formulation of policies related to health and is capable of making or influencing changes to policies related to health that have a population level impact. They must work directly within the health sector or other sectors that intersect with health, such as education, social services, and industry. The particular policymaker target audiences for this funding opportunity include federal, provincial, and territorial ministries of health, education, social services, and industry, as well as regional health authorities and public health departments. All 13 ministries of health have indicated an interest in working with researchers on a project for this funding opportunity. A contact person is listed within the funding opportunity under the additional targeted priorities section. And some ministries have actually listed particular areas of priority that they're interested in. Researchers interested in exploring project opportunities can contact one of these individuals listed um, but keep in mind that you're not restricted to those in that list and you can explore opportunities with others. Depending on the nature of the topic, disciplines such as actuarial science, anthropology, commerce, communications, economics, political science, and other relevant social and health, social sciences and humanities disciplines could be part of project teams. So there, there may be many policy options within the three broad thematic themes that are a priority for this funding opportunity. So 
so one example which falls under health system sustainability is um, you could take for in controlling appropriate use and costs of new technologies, how effective have gatekeeping policy approaches been in controlling costs and approve, improving appropriateness? So that, that's one example, but there are many obviously that can fit under these three priority themes. And if you have a question about whether your particular theme fits for this funding opportunity, please do not hesitate to contact us. Now there are three distinct phases that um, are part of the policy analysis project supported through this funding opportunity. Applications submitted must document the plans within each of the phases and this will be assessed as part of the review process. I'll highlight the components of each of the phases, however the details can be found again in the funding opportunity. In phase one, there is an explicit agreement between the researcher and the policymaker that clearly outlines the agreed upon policy issue for analysis, the methods and data that will be used to undertake the, the analysis, and the knowledge exchange and dissemination plan. Also in this phase, the research evidence on the issue is analyzed, as well as key economic, political, cultural, and social dimensions, and health sector characteristics that may impact the feasibility of the various policy options. The key stakeholder groups are identified in their interests, position, and power, and the research team develops the top three feasible policy options based on the analysis. These again should be grounded in a theoretical concept or analytical framework, and their implications should be discussed in your application. At the end of phase one, a draft report that is no longer than three pages would be created. And moving into phase two is where the research team hosts a health policy roundtable with policymakers who have expertise in the area to review and discuss the evidence and form policy options. At this roundtable, the participants would explore and discuss relevance, feasibility, and clarity of the options that have been presented, the implementation considerations, and implication on health and health system outcomes. The group will advise on how to refine or tailor the options for the particular policy environment for which the report is intended. And in phase three, the research team will incorporate the feedback from the roundtable, revise the policy options, and finalize the policy analysis report. Ultimately, we would like the results of the policy analysis work to be undertaken, that is undertaken to benefit policymakers across Canada, and so CIHR would like to ensure the results are made widely available in a timely way. Up to $150,000 are available to each project for a period of one year. Up to 15 applications can be funded based on the funds currently available. Specific CIHR institutes have dedicated funding to support projects that are relevant to the EIHR priorities of healthcare financing and funding models, governance and accountability and sustainability of healthcare system, but that also address their particular areas of interest. These partner institutes are aging, health services and policy research, human development, child and youth health, infection and immunity, and population and public health. More detailed descriptions are provided at the end of this funding opportunity under partner collaborator descriptions. Funding is also available through the Institute of Health Services and Policy Research to support one project team whose work aligns with the European Observatory's performance program. The requirements to have a Canadian policymaker and a researcher as principal applicants still remains. The successful team will have the opportunity to undertake a portion of their research in London, England with the research team at the observatory and to draw upon the observatory's expertise and establish methodologies and comparative analysis. To be eligible, applications must adopt a comparative policy analysis methodology consistent with that of the observatory and be within one of four um, areas, efficiency, health system responsiveness, financial protection, and equity of health and access to health services. If this opportunity interests you, please contact CIHR for specific details. Applicants must request a letter of support from the observatory, and this letter must be included along with the full application to CIHR. 
the deadline for approaching the observatory for a letter of support is August 22nd. Be sure to read the funding opportunity carefully for details on eligibility and allowable costs for CIHR grants. A couple of things to note, however, it is expected that at least $15,000 of the total budget be allocated to a policy roundtable. This is part of phase two of the project. And costs for international, national, provincial, or regional networking and exchange activities are eligible and can be included as part of the budget. In addition, a release time allowance for policymaker involvement in the project is available. Again, details are outlined within the funding opportunity. Now, how will applications to this funding opportunity be evaluated? All integrated knowledge translation applications at CIHR undergo a merit review. Merit review means that both knowledge users and researchers on the review panel are on the review panel and that each proposal is reviewed by at least one of each. Each proposal is scored on both potential impact and scientific merit. This next slide shows the CIHR's merit review scale. Potential impact and scientific merit are each scored separately and weighted equally. The score for potential impact and scientific merit must each be 3.5 or above in order for the application to be eligible for funding. The two scores are then averaged into a single score. So the review criteria headings that you'll find in the funding opportunity are outlined here. And I'll take a few minutes to highlight a few of the things that you may want to note as you prepare your application. So first of all, the policy issue. And in this section, uh, be clear about the policy issue, what it is, and, and ensure that you explain its relevance to at least one of the, the three um, evidence-informed healthcare renewal objectives. And this is important in order for your, your application to be eligible for this competition. Be clear about the origin of the issue and demonstrate that the issue has been identified by the policymakers and responds to their needs. Highlight the potential for ap applicability and transferability to policymakers across Canada. Second is the policy analysis approach. In this section, you want to ensure the design addresses the three phases of the funding opportunity and the required components. Be clear about and specific about your proposed methods. It's important not to assume that the committee is familiar with the methodology you've chosen. Justify your approach. Someone on the committee is bound to disagree with you. Ensure policymakers are engaged throughout and include a reasonable end of grant knowledge translation plan appropriate for the project's goals and audiences. Next is the feasibility of the project. Here it is important to demonstrate that the researcher policymaker team has the, the requisite skills and experience and resources to complete the project within the one year time frame. Document the expertise of each team member and their role in the, in the project. Include expertise on your project team in the content area to be covered, expertise in policy analysis methods, and experience working with policymakers. Be clear about why each member is on the team, their strengths, and how they are able to do the work. Demonstrate that this is a doable study from both a scientific and a practical perspective and link the KT activities to a thorough budget justification. The fourth and final section is the impact. A case for the impact of the policy analysis results needs to be made clearly. Consider the potential impact of your study and its trans transferability. Illustrate how it will have an impact on financing, sustainability, and or governance and accountability of Canada's healthcare systems. While the project is intended to respond to the needs of the participating policymakers, findings can have a greater impact depending on the extent to which the results are transferable to other contexts. It should be transferable enough that other similar audiences will benefit. If it is not transferable, acknowledge and justify this.
From the many applications that we've seen come through CIHR and from hearing comments around the Merit Review Committee discussions, we've outlined a few general tips that we'd like to pass along for the preparation of your application to CIHR. For instance, be sure to read the funding opportunity carefully and understand all the, the requirements and, and contact us, us if there's anything that you're unsure of. Give yourself sufficient time to prepare the application and get things like required signatures in time for the application deadline. Make sure your project is doable in the time frame. There is one year allotted for this project and you, that you have the right mix of skills on your team for the topic. It is also important to clearly articulate the theoretical and conceptual framework. Don't assume that the reviewers will make certain inferences. Keep in mind, again, that your application will be reviewed by both researchers and knowledge users. And, and as you write the, re the application, keep, keep this in mind. And ensure that your proposal flows logically, is clearly written, and easy to read. Some common pitfalls that we see from time to time in applications are that the research question is unclear, the objectives are unclear. In, in cases there are weak or token knowledge user involvement in the project. And some projects lack theoretical rationale. And finally, there can be a lack of specificity in the methodology that can be a problem in the review. Now the key dates for this competition are August 22nd as the deadline to approach the European Observatory for a letter of support. Applications are due to CIHR on September 19th, and you will hear the results of the competition um, by March 12th, 2013. If you have any questions as you're preparing your application, here are the, the people that you can contact. For questions about the initiative and the strategic research objectives, you can contact myself, Jennifer Campbell. For questions about uh, the CIHR funding guidelines, how to apply, and the merit review process, you can contact Jeff Warren, and the contact details are provided. Within the funding opportunity, and here you'll see the contacts for technical support. And I also wanted to take an opportunity to mention other funding opportunities that are available through the Knowledge Translation branch. And, and to note that just this week, a, diff a new group of funding opportunities was posted on the CIHR website. So I encourage you to vis visit that for the most recent uh, details. Also available on our website are a number of resources, um, KT resources that you may want to access. Um, again, you'll, you'll have access to this presentation on the CIHR website after the webinar, and you can go directly to some of these links. Um, to to help with the preparation of your application. There's, there's um, the KT Clearinghouse, uh, a new CIHR guide to knowledge translation planning at CIHR, integrated in end of KT, end of grant approaches. And we have uh, a variety of online learning modules. So that concludes the webinar um, presentation portion. And um, I want to thank you for participating. We hope this has provided some clarification for you about the funding opportunity and the requirements. And um, we have uh, an opportunity now for questions. And individuals with me from the program delivery branch, um, Nancy Mason McClellan, and uh, Dr. Robin Tamblin, who is the scientific director of the Institute of Health Services and Policy Research. So at this time, we'll open um, the webinar up for questions, and Tiffany will uh, assist with, with the questions and answers. Thank you. All right, so the first question pertains to availability of the information, and uh, we have someone just looking to know where on the CIHR website the PowerPoint will be posted or the extended deck. I think um, we can actually make this available to you through email following the, um, the, the webinar. And we'll also post it in the evidence-informed healthcare renewal section of the CIHR website um, under the funding opportunity section.
All right, another question is, where can one access the list of ministerial contacts you referred to? So the list of ministerial contacts actually appears right within the funding opportunity itself. And if you look in the funding opportunity, there is a section that's headed um, the partner participation. So that uh, falls under the heading funds available. You'll see partner participation. Oh, sorry, I'm just looking at it here. Um, it's called, sorry, additional targeted priorities. And it's in the body of the funding opportunity. And each provincial ministry it has a heading. Um, if there's a priority, a particular priority area that they've identified, it is listed. And then a contact name and email. But again, you're not restricted to only those listed in this funding opportunity for your project. All right, we have a few questions now. We'll start with one about representatives. So do representatives from district health units meet the criteria for knowledge user partners? Yes, they would. And another question regarding guidelines and tips is, do you have any guidelines or tips as to how broad or narrow the research question should be and how diverse the methods should be, i.e. review of existing literature only versus new data collection as well? Yeah, I think that depends on, on the topic and it also depends on the needs of the, the policymaker partner on the application. Um, and I just invite uh, Robin Tamblin to, to add any particular comments or advice to this question. Okay. So uh, thanks for... Um, for the question, Jen, I, I agree with you completely. I think this depends a little bit on the question or the policy comparison that's be, that's being proposed, and uh, and then what would be appropriate in those contexts. So it could involve a simply review of the literature, but it could also involve uh, some real-time data collection uh, about uh, current policies that are underway. And I think this would depend very much on uh, what the policy question is. So some, let's say, for example, of of um, containing costs related to future complications of, of obesity. These policies are just being rolled out now and it may be something that would warrant much more real-time data collection than, than, for example, activity-based funding where there's a fair bit that's already been done and a fair bit that's already been uh, assessed about that. So I think it really does depend upon the question, but thanks for giving me the opportunity to weigh in a little bit on it. Thank you. All right, so I believe we have one question via voice over IP, so I will attempt to pass the mic to the individual who requested it. So Amy, whenever you wish to share your question, you may go ahead and do so. Oh, that's all right, it's already been answered, perfect. So we have a question regarding the analysis of research, the overview states that the health, social, economic, cultural, and political dimensions of the issue must be analyzed. Are we required to analyze all these dimensions? Yes, again, depending on the topic that you've chosen, some may be more applicable than others, but you should reflect on each of those dimensions and, um, and mention them where, where appropriate or explore them where appropriate for the application and the topic that you're exploring. And another question, can you have more than two principal investigators? Uh, yes, you can have more than two principal investigators. Yeah, one of those could be the nominated principal investigator. And from there, you can have as many other princi principal investigators as you wish. And about the availability of this slide deck, again, 
Um, one participant has asked whether or not it will be automatically sent to all who registered via email or if they should request it. But we will send it automatically to all those who have registered for this uh, webinar. And then in addition, we will make it available on the Evidence-Informed Healthcare Renewal section of the CIHR website. Okay, and building upon the question regarding the analysis of research, could you give an example of the different types of dimensions of a problem, especially cultural? Could you read that one more time? Sure. Yeah. sure. So uh, I will ask the, the initial question that they built upon first in order to clarify. Regarding the analysis of research, the overview states that the health, social, economic, cultural, and political dimensions of the issue must be analyzed. Are we required to analyze all of the... Oh, Sorry, my chat jumped. Further to this question, could you give an example of the different types of dimensions of a problem, especially cultural? Um, Robin, if you're if you're able to weigh in on this, that would be helpful. Um, my my sense is that the cultural dimensions would depend um, on the the topic, but might deal with um, things like. Um, um, populations such as Aboriginal populations or um, um, urban r versus rural populations. But Robin, could you add? Yes, it, uh, I'm, I'm muted. Oh yeah. Okay. So uh, just to add to that, I think the the dimensions that are laid out in the RFA are aimed at making sure that people aren't too narrow in their thinking about what dimensions may matter in terms of policy analysis. So just to put that as a um, sort of background to why we opening up the door to these to these other uh, domains is just to make sure, as Jennifer said, that you think about whether any of these are germane. When it comes to things like um, cultural uh, issues, uh, when you're putting policy, some policy options may be dramatically affected by the cultural context or by cultural subgroups. Uh, Jennifer highlighted one example. Uh, you know, back to our obesity example of obesity strategies is uh, those that are being rolled out may, um, in, in some um, countries, in, fa in fact, may um, be counterproductive in certain cultural groups, let's say, for example, because of cultural eating practices and so on. And so that policies would need to be perhaps adapted to, to this kind of a context if you're going after nutritional issues, as has been done even in Health Canada, setting BMI targets for groups uh, is can't be done homogeneously. It has to be done um, targeted to specific cultural groups who, who have different risk factors. So these are just the examples, but I just want to highlight that this is meant to say Consider, reflect upon all these domains. Many, many, some of them may not be relevant, but it, but don't close yourself to thinking this is only purely within the health domain. It could be broader than that. Thank you, Robin. All right. So we have another question regarding principal investigators. Um, one principal investigator needs to be from Canada. Are there any guidelines on where the other participant should be and the relative compensation? Does the Canadian investigator get all or what percentage of the funding? Can you hear me? Um, this is Nancy. Um, the, the nominated principal investigator must be from Canada. Other principal investigators can be from outside the country. All funding would flow to the institution of the nominated principal investigator, um, and it would be up to the nominated principal investigator to negotiate or work out the funding flowing from their institution to the other um, investigators' institutions as appropriate. So we do allow for it, but it is um, outside of the guise of CI as to how much flows to which institution. Thank you, Nancy. All right. Um, another question. There was mention of more than token inclusion of some stakeholders. It was a slide towards the end. How can one ensure an integrated and satisfactory inclusion? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So again, the the premise of this is that we want to be able to provide policy analysis, research, and evidence to decision makers that will actually be implemented and used by them, and therefore it needs to be highly relevant to what they're working on presently and, and what is a priority for them. So for instance, you might want to avoid, um, you know, the, the researcher might come to one of the one of the listed contacts in the funding opportunity from a ministry and have a great idea about a policy analysis topic, but um, if it's not something that's necessarily important to them, um, um, then that that wouldn't be as uh, impactful as if it if it were. So. Um, you know, in, in cases in some applications that come to CIHR from an IKT perspective, um, they, they're, you, you might see applications where the investigator lists a uh, knowledge user applicant on the application, but they really haven't been involved in the upfront planning, um, developing the question, developing the methodologies. So that's what we would consider more of a token uh, representation of that knowledge user and in this case, policymaker um, applicant on the project. Are there any other questions from uh, the participants? We have a question about what is the role of the UK-based institution? So the European Observatory in the UK is um, just a, an additional opportunity within this funding opportunity where one team will have the chance to work in close collaboration with the European Observatory um, and consult and, and learn from them about their methodologies in comparative policy analysis. So their role um, on the project itself, um, it still has to be a project that's driven by a Canadian policymaker applicant um, together with a researcher and so they wouldn't necessarily be um, you know one of those primary applicants on your application but you would however need to approach them in advance so we've given the deadline of August 22nd just to and there's a template form that um, you would fill out to explain what your project entails um, they would look at that and, and assess the fit with what their objectives are. Um, and if there is a fit, they will provide a letter of support to you to include in your application the CIHR. So they will um, identify only those that they think there might be a fit, and then it really will be up to CIHR's merit review process um, to identify the highest rated project that has applied with an interest in working with the European Observatory and that one project would receive the funding. So as of right now, we have no new questions, but feel free to share any via chat or again, raise your hand if you wish to participate via voice over IP. We're not seeing any new questions come forward. Um, just a reminder that at any time you can contact CIHR and um, get more information and ask any questions, um, you know, pass your proposed topic by us um, and we'll provide comments. Um, and September 19th is the application deadline, so we hope to, to see lots of applications submitted. Was there another question, Tiffany? Okay, so I'll follow up on that question after the webinar. And thank you everyone for, par for participating and good luck with the preparation of your applications. Okay.